be with Brother Whitney and to get better acquainted with Brother and Sister Gray. I've appreciated them what little time likewise I've been able to get acquainted with them. And it's so good to have Brother and Sister Sheridan here as well. I know they're part of your group, but it's my second time to work with them in a camp meeting, and I just appreciate them so much. And it's good to see the Victory Trio here. Uh, we were together a few years ago in the Deep South. So good to see each of you here this evening. When I drove up tonight, I wasn't sure who was preaching, and uh, I said to the young man who was trying to get me a room, I said, uh, who's preaching tonight? Do you know? He said, I've heard Brother Whitney is. I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> I relaxed for a little while till the general told me I was up. So then I had no more relaxation. That coming through. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're down there, Sister Moosh, and I wish you would stay the whole camp if you could. We need somebody to be a cheerleader on the front row there. Praise the Lord. We're so glad you're here. I'm reading from Zechariah chapter 4, if you have your Bible with you this evening, Zechariah's prophecy chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4, that's immediately after the little book of Haggai toward the end of your Old Testament, just ahead of Malachi. Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches? which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Let's bow our heads, please. Sister Mushin, would you stand and pray for us, please? Holy Ghost. 
Holy Ghost. Yes, have your blessed way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Have your blessed way. Have your blessed way. Amen. <coughs> yes, have your blessed way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, blessed Holy Ghost, Jesus' name, grant it to be so, dear Lord, have your blessed way, glorify thy name, for Jesus' sake, have your way, Holy Ghost, amen. Amen. Grant it to be so for thy glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Mushin. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I don't get nervous at all if you shout and say amen and do anything you want. I've had to move out of the way when I get down front preaching to let someone run by. I can move pretty quick. So please, uh, let's just keep free in the Lord and let him have his way. When I really get nervous is when everything gets real tight. I don't mind it getting a little tight if God is working and dealing. But on the other hand, let's let the Lord have his way. What do you say? I don't think anyone has to leave real early tonight, do you? If you have to, be sure you slip out one of the back doors. Don't come up toward the front. Go clear toward the back. I'll try to speak as fast as I can, and I can speak faster if you'll back me, okay? I get slowed down if you get slowed down. But I'll do my best. I'm not sure what to cut out, but I was thinking it's camp meeting, and the Pilgrim Holiness people taught me that you don't get in a hurry. Some of you didn't get that. It was the pilgrim holiness people that taught me that if God is going to have his way, you don't have a time to stop. There's a time to start, but there's no real time to stop. Praise the Lord. It's kind of like a baseball game. There's a time to start, but you don't know how long it's going to last. Well, somebody said it lasts for nine innings, but what if it gets tied up? And how long is an inning? Well, it depends on how many people are striking out. I've been in some services where it seemed like everybody was striking out. But, oh, I like to get in where somebody hits a home run once in a while. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I'm going to do my best to mind the Lord. But uh, if there's anything you don't like, it's like I tell them so many places, just blame it on the Pilgrim Holiness people back there in northeastern Ohio in the early 1950s. Praise the Lord. Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet. He was born in the land of Babylon during the time of captivity. When Cyrus issued the decree for the Jews to return back to their homeland in 536 B.C., Zechariah was among those who returned back. The name Zechariah means the Lord remembers. It was a number of years later in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah with a message for the Israelites who had returned from Babylon. It was a message concerning repentance. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But here, friend, they did not hear nor hearken unto me. Zechariah acknowledged that both their fathers and the former prophets had gone the way of all mortal men 
That is, they had passed on to an eternal word. But he reminded them that God's word is unchanging and all that had been predicted or foretold did come to pass or would come to pass. About three months later, God gave the prophet a vision in which he saw a man riding upon a red horse. Then he saw the man standing in a valley in the midst of myrtle trees, and behind him were other horses. Some were red, others were speckled, and yet others were white. Zechariah asked an angel who was standing by what the horses and their riders signified. The man standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. The riders of the other horses then made their own response. And they said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. The man who was upon the red horse, the one first seen by Zechariah, is identified at least two times as the angel of the Lord, which evidently means he is the Lord Jesus Christ appearing in a human form prior to his incarnation at Bethlehem in Judea. The angel of the Lord then makes request of the Lord of hosts, who must be God the Father. And he prays unto him, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah? against which thou hast had this indignation these threescore and ten years. The Lord then answers with good and comfortable words. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. I am returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I thought when Brother Gray was talking about a dormitory going up, we're serving the same God who prospered Israel, and he'll prosper his people. Hallelujah. Following this message of the Lord, Zechariah lifted up his eyes, and he saw four horns. He was told or asked what they represented and was told that they denoted the powers or the nation that God had allowed to bring judgment and devastation upon Israel and Judah. He then saw four craftsmen or carpenters who represented the Gentile nation which would cast out the powers that had subdued God's people. As Zechariah lifted up his eyes yet another time, he saw another vision wherein was a man standing with a measuring line in his hand. The prophet asked him, Whither goest thou? He responded by telling the prophet that he was going to the city of Jerusalem to measure the length and the width of the city. About this time the angel which had been talking to Zechariah departed and another angel came to the first one with this message. Run, tell, speak to the young man. Uh, we're not sure who the young man is at this point. There are many coming into the picture of this prophetic scene. But if it is the young man with a measuring line in his hand, the message is, it's foolish for you to take time to measure the city. Some think the young man is Zechariah, but whoever it may be, the message is clear. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. My friend, this expression, wall of fire, no doubt alludes to an ancient practice among hunters in ancient times 
who built campfires at night around them in order to keep the wild beasts from charging them. My dear friends, we must have the Shekinah presence of Almighty God in our midst if we would have a wall of protection about us. Yes, we need that sweet, unexplainable manifestation of His glory springing forth out of our inmost being. We must have it above everything else. The Jews yet remaining in Babylon are now urged to leave and return to their homeland with the promise that God will afford them needed safety and security. For God said, He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Praise the Lord. The apple of the eye is the pupil. And friend, this is the most sensitive part of a human eye. Oh, we take great pains to shield our eye from any possible injury. But what a beautiful picture here. God is saying that His people are the pupil of His eye. And if any would dare to arise to do injury to God's people, the most sensitive part of the divine nature is touched. And my friend, there is a response on the part of God to protect His people. He raises His almighty hand. Hallelujah. I say, if God be for us, who can be against us anyway? Hallelujah. Bless His name forever. Yes, my friend, another vision now unfolds before the man of God. And he beholds a judicial setting in which the spiritual needs of Judah are now revealed. Here are the returning Jews. They have come back from a foreign land. They've experienced a physical restoration to their homeland. Now they need a spiritual restoration to their God. Joshua, the high priest, is seen standing before the angel of the Lord. Joshua is clothed in filthy garments. He is thus seen to be a representative of sinful mankind, including the priesthood. Joshua is standing before God, who is the judge. He is under condemnation for the sins of the people of Israel. Standing in the court at the right hand of God, the judge is Satan, who is waiting to bring accusation against the children of God. But my friend, before he can speak, the Lord God rebukes him and makes it exceedingly clear that he, Jehovah, has chosen his people in Jerusalem as a people, a brand plucked out of the burning. Hallelujah. Yes, it's true. The returning Jews had indeed been guilty of transgressing divine law. But God's mercy was soon to be poured out upon them. Surely the Lord God, who had snatched them out of the fire, out of the burning, would not cast them back in again. The children of Israel have been rescued from Babylonian captivity. And in just a little while, they're going to be delivered from their iniquity. Hallelujah. Oh, friend, do you get the picture? There are people here in the camp meeting that God in mercy has pulled out of an accident, has pulled out of an occasion when eternity loomed before them. In the mercy of God, you're here. Thank God for the prayers that have gone up. You've been rescued from death physical, but He wants to rescue you from spiritual death. And I believe there are going to be victories because of prayer and intercession that has gone up. Hallelujah. The Lord gave this command to those that stood nearby. Take away the filthy garments from Him. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua and said such things precious words. I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment, 
Friend, that's what he does when he saves the soul. He takes away those garments of sin and gives us a robe of pure white. Hallelujah. At this point, Zechariah enters the discussion. He can't keep silent any longer. And hear him as he says, let them set a fair mitre or a turban upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed them with garments. You'll remember that in the Old Testament, the high priest bore, wore a beautiful turban. He wore a mitre that had a gold plate on it. And engraved on that plate to be seen so visibly were the words, Holiness unto the Lord. Oh, what a message. Hallelujah. My friend, I believe that the placing of that mitre upon the head of, of Joshua in some way prefigures that wonderful work of cleansing in entire sanctification. Just as the removing of the filthy garments and the putting on of the new depicts that pardon and impartation of divine life. It appears that the preceding visions have had a draining effect upon the physical strength of Zechariah, for he fell asleep and needed to be awakened to see the vision revealed in chapter 4. Or it may mean that the prophet became so entrenched in the visions that God had given him that now he must be shocked into an awareness that God is ready to give him one more vision. The heart of my message tonight is found in this marvelous message in Zechariah chapter 4. Notice with me, first of all, the problems confronting Judah. There was in the first place the problem of an unfinished temple. Soon after the Jews returned back to Jerusalem, they build an altar and reestablish the Levitical sacrifices in accordance with Mosaic law. In the second month of the second year after their return to Jerusalem, they laid the foundation stones for the new temple. Go back with me in your mind's eye, if you will, and try to look upon the scene. They've been offering up blood sacrifices, but now they're laying the foundation to build a new temple for the worship of Jehovah God. As the foundation stones were being completed in their laying, the priests took up their trumpet and the Levites got hold of their cymbals and they began to praise the Lord. They then began to sing praises to Jehovah. Apparently they were singing from Psalm 136, for they were singing these words, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. I tell you, those people Amen. got mightily blessed. They acted like you were acting in the song service. They began to shout and to praise the Lord as they witnessed the reaching of a new milestone. However, if you look carefully, you'll see many older priests and Levites and family heads as they weep aloud. For they had seen the great splendor and the glory of Solomon's temple. And no doubt, this new temple foundation was much smaller and would not have as much glamour or glory in some ways as Solomon's temple. But God said, Who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. My friend, God was working on the scene. And in an atmosphere like that, shouting and tears are in order. Oh, I believe that if God has His way, there will be shouting and there will be tears and a manifestation of God's presence in our midst. Please pray for me. Those air conditioners don't help me in Cincinnati. You know, that's as far as far north as you can go to get near the Southland. And 
you get out in the hot weather and get those air conditioners, it doesn't work well, does it? Directly related to the unfinished task of completing the temple was opposition which arose from without, from neighboring peoples. Sometime after the temple foundation was laid, Samaritans and other nearby people became alarmed that the Jews were rebuilding their temple. The alarm was probably precipitated by a fear of losing political power and prestige in the land. These enemies of Israel made a diplomatic appeal to the people of Israel. They wanted to join the workforce. They claimed to be seekers after God. But the children of Judah seemed to discern unpure motives. And they answered and said, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, king of Persia, has commanded us. These neighboring enemies of Judah then tried to discourage the builders. And they even hired counselors to frustrate their plan. Isn't it amazing what carnal people will do to try to thwart the plan and the purpose of God? The Jews should have never given in to the pressure of these Samaritans. But nevertheless, friends, they gave in finally to that peer pressure. And when they did, for 14 long years, the building ceased. But also in direct relationship to the unfinished or the incomplete temple was the matter of opposition from within. Namely, the indifference, the unconcern that began to grip the heart of the children of Judah. My friend, whenever God's people stop fighting the good fight of faith, and the powers of hell, there is but a short step to apathy and indifference and unconcern. Oh, what a subtle thing it is. We're on our guard for outward enemies, but within there is such a subtle danger. In such a state, one becomes self-centered instead of God-centered. Losing interest in God's house one becomes exceedingly interested in his own home. Some two months before he gave Zechariah a message, God had spoken to Haggai and told him to speak to Judah. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. I have an idea that somebody might have been saying in their mind here this evening, Brother Gray, we don't need a dormitory. We can get by without it. But I tell you what, if we have a mind to work and stand shoulder to shoulder, God wants us to move forward. I believe that with all my heart. For the Word of God came back through the prophet saying, Is it time for you O oh, ye to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. The Lord God urged Judah to consider her way, that she had been coming out on the short side concerning food and clothing and wages, all because she had neglected God's house. I believe with all my heart when we mind God in our giving as well as our praying, God enlarges our own capacity to receive His blessing. Praise the Lord. God then admonished the children of Israel to do three things. They were to first go up into the mountain. Then they were to bring back wood. And thirdly, build His house. I wonder where you would need to go tonight in order to mind God. I noticed it's rather flat country around here. You'd have to go a long ways to get to a mountain. And probably you don't have to go there unless there's somebody on a mountainside that you need to make restitution to. But friend, where do you need to go and what do you need to do to mind God to really be walking in all the light that He shed on your pathway? Are you more excited tonight about God's house 
about this camp meeting than your house, your little property, or your acreage, whatever it is. Oh, it's amazing the people that have lost out with God because they got so taken up with their 10 or 12 or 40 acres and began to lose the zeal for the things of God. Upon hearing the message of the Lord, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the remnant of the people obeyed and gave themselves to the work. Yet another problem was facing the Jews, and that was the problem of discouragement. The enemies of Judah were laboring over time to thwart the work of God. Every effort was being expended to bring the work to a standstill. Oh, friend, let's not look at our circumstances or our problems, but let's look to Christ, who is the Christ of every crisis, who has never lost a battle. Vance Havner has rightly said that if we are not optimistic, it's probably because we've got misty optics. I think that's true. Did you hear about the fellow that was washing windows and couldn't seem to get it clear and clean? He kept working and kept looking at it, and it looked dirty. It didn't look very well. I tell you, it all depends on what we're looking out of. It really does. He came, came to find out it wasn't the windows. It was his own glasses. Oh, it's amazing how many people get a critical eye. And if we've got a little speck in our eye, no wonder the other fellow looks like he's got a beam. The problem isn't the other fella. We need to get that little speck out of our own eye. May God have mercy on us. I think Sister Mushin is right. It's not our job to be condemning people. The Holy Ghost is the one who works conviction, not us. And when we try to do His work, we can really spoil the whole thing. Blessed be God. I must hurry. Not only does this passage reveal the problems confronting Judah, but the power necessary for victory. Mention is made, first of all, of the kind of power that is insufficient in itself to bring the victory. And that is simply the power of human beings. My friend, men can exert various kinds of power, to be sure such as physical, mental, or even moral power, but all of these fall utterly short of accomplishing the will of God. God's kingdom is not founded upon the might or the power of man. It just isn't. It's not so much man's ability that God is looking for at all or that He needs. He's looking for man's availability. He really is. And we've got to be willing to be anybody or nobody. Praise the Lord. I heard about a student the other day at God's Bible school who was told that he needed to move along with some other fellows out of a certain house because of a new teacher coming in. Now this could happen at Hope Sound or Union Bible College or Allegheny Wesleyan or Penn View, but it just happened to happen in Cincinnati. But don't look down on us because we're made out of the same kind of mud as everybody else is. But I couldn't believe it. He told the president that there was no way he was going to move. Well, we've come a long way since I grew up as a boy. We never dared talk like that. We said, yes, sir, and no, sir. But we're living in a day of awful permissiveness. I had to be the middleman. That's never fun. I said, look, fellas, I apologize. I'm sorry you have a short notice, but that's the way life is. I had to live in a girl's dorm for several weeks with my family in a little apartment in a hot summer. Wow. But who am I? Who are you? <laughs> but we've got to have everything our way these days. My friend, all of man's talents and abilities without the endowment of the Holy Ghost may be likened to a beautiful new automobile that has absolutely no oil in the engine and no gasoline in the tank. It's utterly powerless. And I tell you what, 
I get rather sick of people that want you to go around calling them doctor. That's right. Come on. I refuse to go around calling people a doctor. If they have an earned doctorate degree, I don't mind doing it once in a while, but I'm not going to do it all the time. I think people ought to be ashamed to ask to be called doctor. I'm in trouble with some of my academic colleagues, but that's all right. I tell you what, somebody said we must have an awful lot of sick people around. And it seems like we're getting sicker with the more we get of doctors. I'm not against education, but I tell you, we need something more than just our heads. Man's performance may be flawless, but if the presence and power of the Holy Ghost is missing, friend, it's like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The only power that's sufficient to move the kingdom of God is that of the Holy Ghost. I believe the greatest need in our movement tonight is for an outpouring of God's Spirit. Oh, many of our young people have not seen what we older ones have seen, and we have an obligation to see God come and reveal Himself. When He has come, He will convince and convict the world of sin and of the righteousness of Christ and of the judgment to come. Friend, God doesn't need a vast number to bring forth victory. If He can only get 300 men who have no weapons but know how to blow a trumpet and carry a, carry a pitcher and a lamp, He can defeat a huge army. And I saw Him come in my last pastorate when only two and three and sometimes four or five were there faithfully morning after morning after morning imploring God to rend the heavens. We saw Him come. It seems like He can't work through big crowds because we would be tempted to say, look what we did. So God has to take the poor and that which is looked upon as being weak to work out His purposes. Oh, friend, it's not by armies nor by the works of men, but by the blessed Holy Ghost. Zechariah was given a vision of this beautiful golden lampstand. He saw the seven lamps above it and the pipes running up. He saw the trees and the pipes leading to it. The oil is symbolic of the Spirit. Only as He can flow through clean and clear channels can the machinery of the church advance. Let me hasten on. I want to look not only at the problems they faced and, and the power necessary for victory, but consider the persons God uses. There are two classes of people mentioned in the passage. These are revealed by the two olive trees. These two trees are identified as the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The consensus among evangelical Bible scholars is that these two anointed ones are Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the civil ruler. Thus the divine plan includes the use of both magistrate and minister or prince and priest. Or, friend, in our own setting today, I think the two olive trees point to the clergyman, the minister on the one hand, and the lay person on the other. Oh, how we need one another, and how we need to lock arms one with another. The preacher can't do it alone. The lay people can't do it alone. We need to be bound together, and we need to stand shoulder to shoulder. Lay people need to raise the hands of the preacher. Oh, what God could do if we could be melded together. Praise the Lord. A number of years ago, a pastor had just moved to a new charge. It was a hot summer Saturday afternoon with lots of work yet to do in order to get ready for Sunday services. And by and by in the afternoon, a farmer stopped by who attended that church. 
but he didn't come with the purpose of helping unpack boxes and put things away and help arrange the furniture. Oh no, he came in a rather crude and uh, rather uh, countryfied manner, which I like very much, to be very honest with you. He just blurted out in his own way, is the new preacher going to go and join with me in prayer like the other preacher did? <laughs> oh, what a question on a hot afternoon. About 91 degrees like today, I guess. Preacher sweating, trying to get everything around. Didn't this layman know that the preacher and his wife could, could receive help? Didn't he know it would really help them if he would offer to move something? Was he so unthinking? <laughs> well, the preacher looked at this farmer and decided there wouldn't be anything wrong with taking some time off from work and spending time in prayer. So he followed him down the road and over a fence, across a field, and finally into the barn. They knelt upon the straw. The preacher said it began like many prayer meetings begin. There was nothing unusual about it at all. But soon the old farmer began to soar in the place of prayer. And he kept climbing higher and higher until he got right into the throne of grace. I tell you, if I don't get there myself, I like to get near to somebody that's getting there. I like to be near to somebody who's boring a hole all the way through if I'm struggling to get through. The preacher said that he was so high and lost in prayer that he was kicking stardust out of the sky until the glory of God was all over that barn. I tell you, it becomes a sacred place where the Holy Ghost is. The preacher was so moved upon that he reached over and tapped, tapped the old farmer on the shoulder and he said, please pray for my daddy. He's not saved. The preacher said he had been praying for 20 years for his unsaved dad and in two weeks he was in the kingdom. Oh, I tell you, we need God. We need people that can touch the throne. We need farmers. We need lay people that know how to get through to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. A few years ago when I was working at AWC, I was traveling with the quartet in January in the Southland. We were in a certain church in the state of Alabama. One of my former students came up to me after service and he said, Brother England, I just wish that you were scheduled to visit my daddy's church in North Carolina. He said, they've been having a perpetual revival for five years. Well, I tell you, my ears perked up. If there's anything that I'll talk about and forget about eating or sleeping or almost anything else, it's revival. If you've got anything to share with me, if you've got anything that'll help me know better how we can have revival, friend, that's the one thing that I believe is the greatest desire and burden on my heart. Oh, I'm interested in evangelism, but I don't believe the strongest preaching is going to have lasting results unless we first have revival among God's people and then there will be an outreach to the unsaved and the lost. I wondered, I wondered why and how they were having revival because we don't hear that every day. Not every year even about a church having a continual revival. I listened intently. He said, Brother England, they have a prayer meeting in that church every night of the week. <laughs> he said, now they don't have one on Sunday night because they have a service and they don't have one on Wednesday night because of the regular prayer meeting. But he said on Monday night and Tuesday night, on Thursday night and Friday and Saturday night, men come to the church to pray. I didn't ask him any questions. I was fully satisfied. Oh, my friend, he said, my dad has a hard time getting to the church ahead of them. They're there anxious to pray. They want to seek God. My friend, 
I'm not here to tell you there's anything wrong with going to a shopping mall on occasion on a Saturday night or a Friday night. But I tell you, anybody that's interested enough in revival to give up time other than Wednesday and Sunday night, God's going to do something for people like that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The preacher and the lay people locking arms together. I come quickly to a close. Notice with me the promise of victory and praise for the same. The problems confronting Judah were real. They're likened to a mountain. And oh, how much my problems look like that to me and your problems look like a mountain many times. But God said, I'm going to take care of the mountain. I've got a bulldozer big enough that I can just level it clear down until it's going to be a level plane. Hallelujah. I can't do it. You can't do it. The lay people can't do it, but God can do it if we'll lock arms together and let Him work. Zerubbabel is going to finish the temple, God said. Mark it down. In spite of enemies, outside enemies, and inside enemies, God is going to enable Zerubbabel to finish the temple. Hallelujah. And friend, I want you to go back to that scene, if you will, in Jerusalem again. Because the day's coming. God said it would take place. The men, the craftsmen, are going to be working in their little shed. They're going to be chiseling out uh, the stone, the headstone that's going to be placed on that temple. They're going to get it all carved beautifully. And then when the day comes, when the temple is going to be completed, a great crowd is going to gather. And as that stone is carried out of that little workshop and brought out, and placed as the capstone or the headstone upon, upon the great temple. It's going to be a time of shouting. It's going to be a time of rejoicing. God said it would be. And the people would shout out when they would see the stone put into position. Grace, grace <laughs> unto it. <laughs> Oh, friend, I don't know whether you're getting the picture or not, but in the Old Testament, everything good that came to God's people was unearned and unmerited. They never could work hard enough for it. It was by the grace of God. <laughs> oh, I like that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I'm looking ahead to the completion of another temple, if you'll allow me to do that. I'm looking forward to the completion of this camp meeting. Not that I'm anxious to leave. Oh no, I'm just delighting myself and I'm going to enjoy myself here in the midst of the battle with you good people. But I'm looking down to the close of this camp meeting because I believe that a camp or a revival is somewhat like building a temple. There's a foundation to lay. and Some of you have been laying it in prayer. There are walls to build and there's a capstone there's a headstone to be put on. And friend, I believe I can see in my mind eye, Brother Gray, I believe I can see that last service on Sunday night to Sundays down the road when the capstone's going to be placed on this camp meeting. I believe it will be amidst the shouts of victory with souls minding God and praying through, having needs met if we'll just mind God, friend. I believe He's going to give us a big capstone to put on. Praise the Lord. I believe God is already working and I'm going to keep watching Him and I'm going to look to see what He's going to do. Oh, we've got our part to play, but my friend, it's not by might nor by the power of man, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Brother, Brother Sheridan, will you come up? Let's stand together, please.